Hello, and we're live with Project Chimps Book Club. Today, we have the book um, Monkey Business with Erica Fleury. Let me tell you a little about the book. Uh, Monkey Business is a history of non-human primate rights. And it examines the diverse issues involved with accepting mankind's closest relative into its ever expanding circle of ethical consideration. Apes, monkeys, and other non-human primates have a dual role in modern society. They are revered for their intelligence, uncanny mimicry, and biological relation to humans, yet are often forced to spend entire lifetimes as unwilling participants in the research entertainment, and pet industries. So we're going to be talking about that book today. That was from uh, Amazon, the explanation of the book. Um, you can buy Erica Fleury's uh, book on Amazon. Make sure you put in Monkey Business with her name, Erica Fleury, to find it. Um, before we bring Erica on and Catherine, our host for today, um, I want to make some announcements. Uh, for Project Chimps. Chimps Rock is just around the corner um, on Saturday, April 15th and April 16th. Uh, you can paint a rock and tour the sanctuary. Kids and adults are both welcome. Uh, secure your tickets now uh, for our first big event weekend of the season. And it's $10 for tickets for a child and the adult gets in free. So um, go to projectchimps.org slash visit and you'll see how to register there. Um, the other thing that's going on is our uh, chimp chocolate sale. Um, if you use a promo code chimpsrock23, you can claim an extra $5 off. So that's only $20 for chocolate. Um, you won't get it in time for Easter if you order online, but you can always come to the gift shop and uh, pick it up there. Uh, the float sale we have uh, for the love of all things. We're partnered with that organization and they are uh, made us T-shirts and uh, hoodies and tanks, all sorts of apparel with a great chimpanzee logo, a proceed a uh, percentage of the proceeds go to Project Chimps. So the sale to get this exclusive shirt is only on this week. Uh, so go to float.org slash Project Chimps and get your t-shirt. Okay, so now I'm going to bring on Catherine, our host from Project Chimps, and Erica Fleury. Hello, both of ladies. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. I'm going to introduce, uh, give a little bit of background on Erica. Um, Erica Fleury is originally from New Jersey and has an English degree um, and philosophy minor and has a passion for primatology. Uh, she has taken a lot of college courses, undergraduate and graduate from on primates and has volunteered and been involved with a variety of sanctuaries. She's currently the program director of the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance or NAPSA and um, has served as an independent consultant to the Primate Rescue Center. Um, she's lived in lots of places, San Diego, New York City, uh, Connecticut, but now she calls Los Angeles home. So that's where she's coming from us today. Um, so welcome and welcome Catherine from Project Chimps. Um, Catherine, I'm going to uh, turn the show over to you so you can ask some questions. That would be great. Thank you, Erica, so much for joining us today to talk about your book. I enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, fortunately, for Project Chimps and uh, my coworkers, 
it's no longer legal to do invasive research on chimpanzees. Unfortunately, um, that means that monkeys now are being used in um, more and more studies. Um, so first of all, let's talk about your book, um, Monkey Business. And one of the things that I found interesting in the beginning is that you said that people had a hard time understanding what non-human primate rights were, um, which really are just uh, rights for primates, which of course we are primates also. Uh, in your book, you say that despite that minority status, we often refer to our closest relatives in this order as non-human primates, which is a way to define them as not like us. Uh, but which can be misleading in terms of the group as a whole. To refer to all other primates as non-human, simply in order to separate them from the less than from the less than 1% of the primate population that is human is akin to referring to almost all apples as non-Macintosh, when only a small fraction of the apple world is actually of Macintosh variety. In fact, this is one only one example among many of the ways humans categorize the world's other species in purely anthropocentric terms. What's interesting to me is that we, we think we're special. Mm -hmm. You know, I say this all the time to people that I know, especially when um, I see animals do something that we do as well, you know, especially when it's something um, empathetic or compassionate or, you know, where they have no gain for themselves. Um, and I always say, we think we're so special and we're not, they're so much like us. Um, so we think that all people should have basic rights, but what makes a person? Do you have an opinion about that? We could talk about this for five more hours, I think, but it's, I just think it's so that example with the apples just shows how um, uh, strange our categorization is. And it, it helps justify a lot of things that humans do. But why are we different than them just because we have certain characteristics and they have other characteristics? Like why are ours valued more than theirs? And that's that's why exploitation happens. And, you know, you had a, a great comment in the beginning that when this book was written, you know, this book is 10 years old and a lot has thankfully changed since I wrote it. But one of the most important things is that chimpanzees are now considered fully endangered as a species. And so they're no longer tested in biomedical research. And that was something that continued. Again, when I wrote this book, we didn't see the end coming yet. And it's, it's, it's kind of startling that it's already happened and we're trying to get all these lab chimps out to sanctuaries like Project Chimps. But you know, it's all just because humans are happen to be in charge right now. And, and we think that, it, that we should be. And, and uh, you know, that's, it's questionable about, about the veracity of that. I, I agree completely. Um, we use them in research, primates, because they're so much like us. Um, but then people think that they're so much different than we are, you know, to justify. We would never put a human through the kind of uh, testing and captivity that we're putting these primates through. And yet they're so similar to us with their brain capacity and, and so forth and their feelings and sentient beings, et cetera. I uh, am always surprised when people are surprised that the chimps know their names. You know, so many of us have dogs and cats at home and they are so much further from humans than primates are, other primates. And yet we're surprised that they are smart enough to know their own names. I think a lot of it comes to financial gain. Um, I think that's what drives most exploitation in general, but surely when it comes to chimps, it's undeniable that they are so, I mean, the research that's out there now is just plentiful that, that how sentient they are, how aware and cognizant and smart and intelligent. I always compare them to a, a young child. And so if we wouldn't be comfortable exposing a young child to a certain type of treatment, why is it okay for a chimpanzee? Um, and that's that's the basis of all this. And that's why I wrote this book. It, when I wrote it, um, I could sense that our culture was about to shift when it came to primate rights. And I wanted to document what had happened because that gave it some so it made it more real. And, it you know, by collecting it all, someone could read it like you and see, say, wow, we made it this far. There's more to go. 
but look at this. And so it sort of, I was hoping that it would drive the progress forward and the progress moved forward regardless, but, but that's been really beautiful to see. I'm really happy that some of this book is now obsolete because so much has changed and, and that so many people think like you do about how, how strange it is that these, you know, incredible creatures have been misused in so many ways by humans in, in the yeah. last few decades. Yeah. Very good. Mm -hmm. Um, Speaking of, where are we now? I mean, I know that in 2015, when it became illegal to do invasive research on chimps, there were nearly a thousand chimps that were in labs across the United States. Over 700 were privately owned pri labs that were mm -hmm. privately owned. Um, I know that we have 97 chimps at the sanctuary, at our sanctuary today, but there are other sanctuaries in the United States. Where are we with chimpanzees in the lab versus in sanctuary? What's really exciting is that as of about two years ago, we finally um, made the, we turned a corner and more sanctuaries, more chimpanzees were in sanctuaries than in laboratories for the first time ever in this country. And I remember seeing that in my computer and it, 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 that was another moment that felt a little surreal, like, oh my God, we're there already. <laughs> and, and it's because of sanctuaries, the larger ones in particular that can take these groups of chimpanzees in large numbers. Um, like Project Chimps, like Chimp Haven and Save the Chimps, um, because right now there are only 224 chimpanzees in laboratories. And that's a big change from 2015. Um, the reason why there still are some in laboratories is because the sanctuaries need to physically expand to take more, just like Project Chimps is fundraising to expand to take more uh, chimpanzees there. The others are too. And so it's a it's a progress. It's, it's a process that takes a lot of time and fundraising. And, you know, as nonprofit organizations that just survived a pandemic, the money isn't always plentiful. Right. So it's, it's going a little slower than some people might like. But but huge amounts of progress have been made and, and we'll get there in time. That's wonderful. I I'm so frustrated by the lack of progress over the last several years, um, just in all things, not just at the sanctuary level, but um, it just seems like we were on such a roll there in the beginning of 2020 to just be, you know, halted. Yeah, yeah. And there, there is some projects that I think also documented the progress. Like there's a film, it, it's called The Last Chimpanzee, and it documented um, the last chimpanzee used in Hollywood. His name was Eli. Okay. Um, so I know um, I was interviewed in that and a few other um, NAPSA and Sanctuary people were interviewed um, and that should be coming out soon. But again, that's something that would have come out to document and celebrate a big shift, um, but it was put off because of the pandemic and just like just like so much of our lives. So there's there's some good things coming, I think, that we can celebrate. Speaking of chimps, who is behind your left shoulder? <laughs> so that's Sai. Um, Sai is a chimpanzee who used to, well, he started out life in a laboratory, um, called LEMSIP. It was a New York uh, state, New York university laboratory that shut in the mid nineties. And at the time, a lot of chimps were shuttled out, thankfully to sanctuaries. He ended up, he ended up at the wildlife way station in California, which then unfortunately shut down unexpectedly in 2019. So for the last three years, uh, I have been working along with a number of people to rescue those chimps. And Project Chimps was a huge help in transporting some of them. Um, so Sai is now living at Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest in Washington State. And that picture is on my wall because he looks so happy and content and it's bright and clean where he is. And, and it, it justifies every bit of hard work that we've all put into this project because as as i'm sure you know catherine when you see chimps come from substandard or harmful or you know damaging environments into a sanctuary they thrive and they they physically change and i mean sai looks so happy and i'm just thrilled for him and and the 40 other chimps that we rescued but but it's an, it's just one example of many about why we do this work Yes. Uh, the chimps that come to the sanctuary here, they change almost instantly. They just seem to relax almost on day one and their hair grows in and their muscles develop. And it's really great to see. Um, mm -hmm. So that's awesome. Mm -hmm. That's great for chimps. But where are we with other primates? Because, of course, 
you know, I can talk all day about great apes. You know, I know that uh, information, but there are so many other primates that are being used. Um, yeah, there are. And with monkeys, the situation's a lot different and um, it's more frustrating to be honest because the end is not in sight yet. Yeah. Um, with chimps, you know, we, we know where they all are. We know that they're no longer used in certain industries and, you know, like entertainment and even the pet trade. Um, so we're working to get out those chimps into sanctuaries out of these horrible conditions. But, um, when it comes to monkeys, it's different. And that's because, well, there's a number of reasons why, but there's no law limiting their use in these industries. So there's not even a good number. You know, when people ask how many chimps are living in human homes in the U.S. right now, I could tell you. But when it comes to monkeys, I couldn't tell you because there's nobody documenting it. There's no system in place to to permit it federally. There's no federal law on the ownership of primates. So different states have different laws. They're enforced to different degrees, to be honest. And so um, there are some states that have little to no restrictions on ownership. So there can be an unlimited number of pet of primate pets living in that state. So to have a number is, is incredibly difficult. And I, I, about once or twice a year, I always look to see, is there, is there a statistic anywhere? And nobody has it because nobody knows how to even find that information out. Um, so it's frustrating. And, you know, the monkey sanctuaries, like the chimp sanctuaries, are pretty full due to the demand. Um, and they also require physical expansion to take more in most cases. So um, it's very challenging um, because primates never make good pets. Um, they are not domesticated. They will eventually have aggression, bite, attack. Um, they're expensive and challenging to care for. And so most of the time when someone has a pet monkey, they don't want to care for that animal for its whole lifetime. And, you know, monkeys like chimps have very long lifespans, like decades and decades and decades. And I don't think people realize that when they commit to a cute little baby who's easy to, to handle, right? They don't think about when that animal reaches adolescence and is pulling down the curtains and scratching everyone and pulling on your hair. And I mean, it's it's not sustainable. So, right. um, so anim I really am grateful for the animal advocates and animal rights groups that are um, pushing for laws to change. So even since I wrote this book, like I, I reviewed it, when I wrote this book, there were 22 states that banned primates as pets, and now we're at 27. Still a ways to go, but it's progress. Yeah. Um, you know, one day <laughs> we'll look back at our treatment of non-human primates and think it was just so archaic. And how could we have ever done that? You know, just like so many other things in human history. Um, so I, I just look forward to that day and I hope I'm around to see it. I, I agree. Hold on. You just said something that I just read a quote from your book um, in regards to um, so saying how archaic it is, uh, all of this. You have written um, one of the most well-known and hotly debated primate researchers was Harry Harlow. In the 1960s, while working at the Primate Research Center in Madison, Wisconsin, Harlow published results of his psychological studies involving social isolation, um, uh, psychopathy and abusive mother figures by raising infant primates in distressing situations, which depending on the experiment involved years of having no contact with another living creature or interacting with mother substitutes that were in essence, cloth covered machines designed to physically harm the infant once imprinted. Um, imprinting had occurred. Harlow proclaimed to have discovered the arguably logical fact that infants will cling to mother figures despite also receiving pain from them, and that infants raised in social isolation develop pathological tendencies and are unable to form normal relationships later in life. Such socially deprived female primates were then forcibly impregnated and observed as they ignored, mutilated, and killed their subsequent offspring. As described by author Deborah Bloom, his approach was very direct. The easiest way to investigate a loving heart is to break it. The shortest cut to explore a relationship is to sever it. And yet they're genetically so much like us. It's heartbreaking. It's infuriating. And thankfully, I mean, the 1960s wasn't even that long ago, and that was permitted back then. And, and it's those types of studies are not 
done now, thank God. But because I don't know what the purpose even is, right? Right. It's it's, it's just it's malevolent, and so, um, it, you know, the, I think I think at the same time there's probably um, experts out there who could argue that some of the research going on now might be equally as troubling. Although that just you know visual, you picture it in your head when you read what Harlow did, and it's, it's heartbreaking. It is. Well, tell me about the conditions in the labs for monkeys currently or other non-human primates. Well, you know, I'm not an expert in that. And I need to just be a little careful with what um, what I assume about labs. You know, NAPSA, like Project Chimps, we have a lot of other members that work with the laboratories. And so we need to keep that relationship. Um, of course. Okay. I, I just didn't know if they were kept in social groups or mm -hmm. so they are in social groups. Sometimes not. It depends on the experiment, um, the protocol, I should say. Um, so sometimes we get requests for um, most often it's rhesus macaques that are used in lab research. Also, marmosets have been um, a little bit more frequent as well. But let's just say rhesus macaques. Um, they prefer males a lot of the time. And, it, and when they're solitarily housed, even though it's better for the science, it's not better for the animal. And so then it's ever more challenging to integrate that animal into a population because he or she has probably never seen another monkey and doesn't know how to how to interact just like it would be if you introduced a chimp to other chimps they you know it would the introduction would likely fail um not to mention when it tends to be mostly males then the sanctuaries get inundated with males and they need females to have healthy populations and so it's very challenging i think most of the time primates are either recycled into other studies, and I should say monkeys. Monkeys are either recycled into other lab studies or euthanized, um, depending on their health status and depending on the researcher's ability and interest in sanctuary placement. A lot of the times it's not pursued. Sometimes it is, and we're grateful for those researchers that do that. Do you have an estimate on how many monkeys are in uh, labs currently? It's well over 100,000 right now. So we're talking about that there are 224 chimpanzees that are still in labs in the United States and over 100,000 monkeys. Yes. And because the laws have not changed for monkeys the way that they have for chimpanzees, they're still breeding them and importing them and um, replenishing the population. So one problem is that if a sanctuary is fortunate enough to have space for let's say a group of five macaques from a lab, great, they can move there and they do, but then those five might be replaced the next day by another group of five. And it's it's just a vicious cycle and it's it's not financially sustainable um, for the sanctuaries, which are all, you know, they're nonprofit organizations. They physically can't rescue everyone unless there's money and time and strategy to do this. And it's, it, it's we're just not at the point yet where the labs are funding the research, the, the retirements that need to happen. And we're also not at the point yet where all the labs want to retire the animals. So there's a lot more work to do on that. But I do think there's, um, there's this, the same way that humans sometimes are drawn to chimpanzees because they're so much like us. There's this chimpocentrism <laughs> theory. Right. And I like to think that a benefit of that, right, even though there's some negatives, we don't want to leave other species out, but a benefit could be this trickle down concept that if we, you know, chimpanzees now have more legal protections, maybe that means that eventually the others, the smaller primates will too. And so we'll see our culture will acclimate a little slowly and see, okay, these chimps deserved protections and, and look at how much healthier and happier they are in sanctuaries. And gosh, we shouldn't have been testing on them. And then maybe it won't seem so crazy to consider not testing on a monkey that's this big, you know? Right. So that's what I like to think. Yeah. Are, are they, uh, are the labs uh, gaining any knowledge from the testing that they're doing? I know that um, back in 2015, uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife pretty much said, you know, you're not getting this information that you need from testing on chimpanzees, mm -hmm. um, which is what sort of led to um, them no longer being used. But um, are they really getting any good information? I'm also not the expert that can answer that most accurately. But I know one argument I've heard is that, you know, 
animal models can be different than human models and drugs that might react a certain way in a, in a macaque might not react the same way in a human. And that's what they found out with chimps. They were using them for AIDS research and chimpanzees did not develop AIDS the way that humans did. So all of a sudden there were all these chimps that nobody needed for research. So um, I do know that I'm sure monkeys have helped some significant progress been, you know, having been made in the laboratories, but I, I don't know details and I don't want to overstep my boundaries on that. Of course. Um, what can we do though? I mean, other than uh, help with funding, of course, mm -hmm. which would be great or volunteering, um, not just at a primate sanctuary or, but any animals, of course, you know, we're all animal lovers, but uh, other than those types of things, what can we do to help? I think one of the easiest and most pervasive uh, ways to help out there is when you see a video on social media that is exploitive, you may not realize it right away, but there's videos from um, places that may call themselves a sanctuary or may mm -hmm. appear to be a sanctuary or a rescue, mm -hmm. but are actually more like a zoo and use their animals for um, exhibition purposes and also training and public contact, the kind of things that sanctuaries don't do. Um, when you see, think of, think of what you saw in um, Tiger King, right? What some of right. those places were doing. So when you see a video of a chimpanzee hugging a puppy or wearing human clothes or walking around holding the hand of a human, that is not good for the animal. That is not something that you should promote or share or even comment on right now. The suggestions um, from animal rights groups and animal advocacy groups is that even commenting on those videos, even if you say you're you're a jerk, you know, um, doesn't it doesn't help you. It helps them by getting more comments and more views. So leave that stuff alone. When you see it, don't interact, don't share it. Um, and and the hope is that less and less people will interact in those types of places will either be shut down because there's some questionable legalities of what they do or it will eventually go away because it's all based on money. Right. You know? we, um, we do have the opportunity on occasion to have school groups come through the sanctuary. And I think Holly is going to put up a slide that shows one of the things that we try to educate people about. Um, one of the famous uh, greeting cards that you could find at Hallmark shows a chimp um, in the bottom right-hand corner. It looks like the chimp is smiling. That chimp is showing all of his teeth in what looks like a great big grin. Um, that's actually a fear grimace. So if you look at the, the center picture up top, that's one of our chimps, Charisse, that uh, was afraid for a moment for whatever reason, and she's showing all of her teeth. Her mouth is very tight, um, and that shows that she is afraid, just like the chimp in the bottom right-hand corner. To see a chimp that's actually smiling is the chimp on the far left, which is Patrick. He's got a really droopy, relaxed lower lip. That's what a happy chimp looks like. And so um, the difference is hard for humans to see. Thank you, Holly, for putting that on there. Because it looks like a smile to us, um, but of course it's not. Yeah, and that's what I think so many people don't didn't know and just maybe still don't know about the use of primates in entertainment. Um, so much of what they saw on camera was misleading because it was all done through training that was often um, harmful to the animals. Um, the animals show very inappropriate and, you know, un unnatural behaviors that then make people think, oh, I want one as a pet. Because look at this little chimp is walking around in a suit and doing acrobatic work. You know, like, it's completely false. And, and anytime you see a real chimpanzee, like if you go to Project Chimps on one of their donor days and you see what these animals become, it's like, wow, I would never want to be in an enclosed space with one. Yeah. <laughs> they need to be on their own with their own, you know, just like living life. And, and there's a lot of misleading information about that. That's one of the great things. Uh about our, you know, we only have a few open house weekends a year. And um, some of the things that surprise me are that people are surprised at how big they are, mm -hmm. chimps, because of course, anytime they see chimps on TV or something like that, it's always a young chimp that hasn't become too aggressive yet. Um, so they're always surprised at the size. And then if they make eye contact at all, they just can't believe how similar 
how just like with humans, our eyes can speak to one another. Oh yeah. And their hands. I think any too, anytime I see their hands, they look just like our hands and yes. they, they are, <laughs> they yeah. are, they are, you know, they are people and they, they just have different life circumstances than we do, but they are people and they have, they have unique personalities and preferences. And that's what I love. So this, I keep pointing to the wrong thing here. Sorry. This, <laughs> it's, the, it's the disorientation. Yeah. Um, sigh over my shoulder here. He likes to read magazines. And so um, the blog from Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest, it shows him, he'll just sit there with magazines and just go through them and turn the pages. And I mean, you look at that, and it, it, it's just it's just crazy to think that someone like Sai was deprived of his liberties for so long and, you know, not thriving. And, and I'm grateful that now he is. Very good. <sighs> um, so... Back in uh, back in the time that you wrote the book, um, mm -hmm. there were no anti cruelty laws that were applied to research facilities. Um, is that any different now than it was? Because of course we can't kick a dog, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. There are laws against that. Yeah. So research facilities have they're supposed to be overseen by what's called an IA cook. It's an institutional um, like ethics review committee um, mm -hmm. to ensure animal welfare and that the uh, protocols aren't um, duplicitous or harming the animals or unnecessary or something like that. Um, and so the, that's why they exist. But um, I, th they may not work effectively in so at some times. There can be biases between mm -hmm. the people on the committee and the researchers. There can be a lot of conflicts there. And so I know that's been challenging for some advocates to work with. Um, legally, I mean, there's the the um, Animal Welfare Act um, and the USDA are, you know, supposed to ensure a basic level of animal welfare, but that's not much. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> right. When I was looking, when I was reading, um, you had mentioned that all a lab needs to do is say that the pain is necessary for the experiment to be valid um, okay. in some instances, which is which is interesting. And regardless of if there's physical pain during a, a project, a research project, one big issue with um, laboratory and even just ca captive life for primates is that when they're bred, um, they're often taken from the mothers very quickly so that they can be more tractable themselves with the, the, that the infant can be, but also then that the mother could be um, impregnated again more quickly. And so the animal then grows up um, suffering the consequences of that, which can lead to mental problems, physical problems. You know, it's, it's a lifelong thing. And I'm sure there's chimps at Project Chimps who have suffered in this way and still show symptoms even now. I mean, hair plucking, it's very common with um, chimps in captivity. And it's even, you know, the very best sanctuaries like Project Chimps, they they can do everything right and chimpanzees can still suffer because of what happened to them in the past. And it's right. so sad, right? And you just wish you could have a magic wand and tap them and make it all better. <laughs> but but that's part of this these industries that they were born into. They don't think about the lifelong consequences of what happened what happens to them. Right. So we have like six, I guess, uh, chimpanzee sanctuaries in North America that includes um, fauna in Quebec. Mm -hmm. um, do we have sanctuaries for monkeys? Yes. How yes. many? Within NAPSA, and if anyone wants to look at NAPSA's website, you can see a list of our members. Um, but I'll preface that by saying not all sanctuaries are NAPSA members, and that might be a choice, or that might be because they're still getting accredited, or there's a number of reasons. So just because a sanctuary is not a member of NAPSA doesn't mean that they're bad. <laughs> um, so NAPSA, within NAPSA, we have two sanctuaries right now that are monkeys only, um, and that is Primates, Inc. in Wisconsin and uh, Cleveland Amory Black Beauty Ranch, which is in Texas. And they also care for a lot of other like farm animals um, and, and exotics. So, um, so there's many other monkey sanctuaries around the country. Despite that, it's still not enough <laughs> because the need is just so great. And so by far, when I get placement requests, so people can contact NAPSA if they have a primate and say, um, and that's actually not our, 
the, the website there is wrong. It's primatesanctuaries.org. Thank you. <laughs> um, when people contact NAPSA um, about placement, it's almost always for monkeys. I don't get requests for chimps because they're being phased out of the pet trade and lab research and entertainment. It's always about chimp, um, it's always about monkeys. So, so the need is, is overwhelming. How, one of the things that I feel guilty about myself too, I, I'm an animal lover and looking back to all of the things that I've done throughout my life, like swimming with the dolphins and mm -hmm. things like that. Like um, I beat myself up over that. Um, how do people know what a good place is and what a not good place is? So okay. what's the difference between a sanctuary and a roadside zoo? They call themselves a sanctuary or they say that they're a great zoo, but what's the difference? An easy way to tell for sanctuaries is, um, or even for zoos, is, it, is that they're accredited. And there's just like with anything else, there's there's a gold standard for accreditation and then others that don't mean so much. So for sanctuaries, you want to see that they're accredited by GFAS. It's the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries. So Project Chimps is accredited by GFAS. Anyone who's a member of NAPSA has to be accredited by GFAS as well as um, have meet, meeting some other standards. But then for zoos, um, the gold standard for zoo accreditation is AZA. It's the Association of Zoos and Aquariums. There is another organization out there called, I think, ZAA, which um, basically exists to accredit those who can't be accredited elsewhere. And, you know, I'm just saying do your homework. And anyone with questions about an animal care facility can always reach out to me at NAPSA at primatesanctuaries.org. And I'll help you because um, it can be challenging for the average person to know what's a good place and what's not. Um, NAPSA also has a number of documents on our website. And one is a it's a one page, uh, like a position statement or an educational resource about how to tell a true sanctuary from what we're calling a pseudo sanctuary. And that's how you can tell, you know, it'll say like, does not use the animals for entertainment, does not allow photo opportunities, like hugging a tiger or what, you know, a chimp. Um, and there's, there's some markers there that can help you determine who you want to support because even going to visit a, a substandard place, you're, you're indirectly supporting that. And it's not something you should do if you're an animal lover. Right. Um, I just think about, uh, pay to play sorts of situations. You know, we've watched the Tiger King. We've, you know, had discussions with other books and talked about elephants and big cats and lots of different um, wild animals and their use in, you know, the pet trade and, and so forth. And it's very discouraging to think that um, we have so far to go and that there are more wild tigers living in, or uh, I'm sorry, privately owned tigers in, the state of Texas than there are in all of the wild of the world. And yet we keep owning exotic wild animals. It's selfish, right? It's about me, me, me. And that's why people want to take selfies with monkeys when they're on vacation in Costa Rica or wherever, you know, it's, it, it requires, if cha true change is going to require people to think just a little bit more and consider, is this the life I want to support? Is the life of a monkey who has to be chained to, you know, some guy working in the tourist industry to take pictures on people's shoulders, exposed to all those germs, <laughs> you know, you don't know how they're treated off, off site. I mean, there's so many things that you can't see in that picture, but you're supporting it when you do that. And when you go visit these Tiger King like places, that's, that's right. you're supporting it. Yeah. Well, I, I know that my um, my downfall is that I want the animals to love me. <laughs> so I want to meet them so that they can think that I'm great, you know, and um, I think that that's what animal lovers are. They're wanting to have that connection. Um, and just like when you meet someone famous you may meet them and it may be a great experience, but the next day they're not going to remember you. Um, so you don't make, you're not making the connection that you think you're making with the animals. Yeah. And you have to think about if you really, really truly care about animals, what would that animal want? What would that animal choose to do? If they wouldn't choose to be doing that of their own free will, then they shouldn't be doing it. 
And that's why I am proud to work with sanctuaries because it's all about choice. They can do what they want when they want. And, it, you know, in it, that's why it's a safe and healthy place for them to live. Because if a chimp, just like you or I, they might be tired one day and not feel like running around playing, they can go rest in the corner, right? right. If they, if they want to hang out with this friend and not this friend, they can, but but the entertainment and, and roadside zoo industry doesn't permit them that. And that's also, I think, when you see aggression um, come into play and, and you, I, I worry about human safety and a lot of the, you know, even over in addition to animal welfare, I worry about the humans that are exposed to that, too. There's just so many unknowns and so many potential negative things that could happen. Right. Happen. <laughs> Now, are monkeys still being used in, in entertainment in North America? Yes. And so uh, just recently, um, Steven Spielberg's movie, The Fablemans, um, has a scene with a monkey actor. And so every time something like that happens, I will say it's less, I think it, it slowed down a bit, but it still happens. Um, NAPSA and other animal advocates will, will write um, to ask either that that scene be removed or if it's a commercial, that, that the commercial not play. Um, we've had some successes with the Fablemans. Unfortunately, we got no response. You know, the movie came out. Um, and that's a shame because studies have shown that when people see monkeys or any primate in a film um, or in any, you know, on TV, they they don't have correct thoughts on these animals in terms of their conservation status. They're misled about their their ability to live in a human home, you know, and so there's a lot of misinformation spread that way. And that's why it's really disappointing. Every time we see it, we're like, oh no, it's, it's still happening and it's, it's harmful. I, and I think maybe directors might think, oh, it's not that bad. It's just this one monkey, you know, and, and I like the trainer and blah, 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 but it's a terrible life for them um, performing. It must be scary. It's very unnatural to them. You know, there's lights, loud people, like it's just not the life that a monkey should have. And so that's one reason why we're against it. Um, so NAPSA will continue to, to fight those types of situations and hopefully make progress. Very good. What yeah. What is the, do you have a main takeaway about, you know, 2010 when you wrote this book and 2023? Gosh, so much has changed. And I just say I'm relieved that, that some of it is, is incorrect now um, because I was accurate when I sensed that change was coming. Um, I think the main takeaway, and for me, my favorite chapter is the end where I talk about the ethics. That's yes. my, thing. you know, um, Holly mentioned that um, I studied ethics in college and that's always been my love. And that's half of why I got into this field to begin with, because I could talk about it for days and, and there's just so much to explore there. But the main takeaway is for, I think for us to think about why why we're so drawn to these animals and then how should that dictate our behavior towards them? Because right now it's very conflicting. Like you said, we're, we're drawn to them because they're like us, but yet we think they're still enough, not like us to justify their exploitation. Right. Their, their, you know, so, so why is that? And is that, is that okay? I would say it's not. Um, they're so similar to a young child. Would you be comfortable with a three-year-old child being subjected to some of the things that chimpanzees have been subjected to in captivity? I think most people would say no, you know? So it just takes the effort of considering that. And a lot of people go about their day and don't think about that, but I'm asking them to because these animals deserve it. And it's not their fault that they've been put in these terrible, um, you know, situations in life. And now, I'm grateful for the sanctuaries and the advocates working with me to get them out. That's it's, awesome. That's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, very good. Holly, do you have any questions for Erica? Hi, that was a great discussion. I have a, a couple of questions from people that have been watching. Oh, let me bring them oh that's great. So uh, people have commented in. Yes. Um, uh, one person is so hor horrified of the actions from the labs. They want to know what are you and all of us able to do in the now? Um, what what's what's the easiest thing we can do to end to 
I'm trying to think of how to say this properly, but to, to help the animals that are in labs now, mm -hmm. it's tough because unless you're already an insider at a lab, it might seem frustrating. I think the best thing to do is to support the groups that are working to find alternatives to animal models in science. Um, there are a number of them. They're often, um, they have anti-vivisection in the name. That's a, an older name for animal research. Um, so American Anti-Vivisection Society, um, National Anti-Vivisection Society, um, and others um, who, who are working to not avoid science, but to make better science that doesn't involve animal lives. Cool. Thank yeah. And, and supporting sanctuaries, too, who are working to rescue the individuals impacted by this, too, because the individuals matter just as much as the 100,000 monkeys out there. There is a other question about uh, NAPSA promoting sanctuaries such as Project Chimps. Um, they want to know, will you start showing the current residents of each of your sanctuaries to encourage more fundraising? We do that actually um, on our Facebook and our Instagram accounts. So you can find them. Um, let's see. One I think is primate. I think Facebook it's primate sanctuary. And then um, on Instagram, it's NAPSA primates. Um, and you can also find it on our website, but yes, we promote them constantly because the residents are honestly the best thing about the sanctuaries and <laughs> they're beautiful and everyone loves looking at pictures of chimps and monkeys. So that is something I'm happy to continue doing. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that for them. I did have um, a question to kind of wrap us up. I know Catherine just asked about what um, compared it from to, you know, 10 years ago to now, mm -hmm. but what is the most important thing um, you want to leave us with today um, from this discussion? I think for everyone to consider, to continue considering the well-being of non-human species. I, I completely understand, you know, I, I always say I like being their voice because chimps, just because they can't speak like us and have a, a voice the way we do, um, doesn't mean that they're not worthy of being heard. Mm -hmm. And so I think it requires a different type of listening and it requires a different type of consideration. But if our world did that in greater numbers, we would be much better off as humans and the animals living with us would be as well. So I just ask everyone to do that and to be a little bit less selfish and human centered. <laughs> it's hard. I get it. It's hard. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Erica, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you today, and we're so glad that uh, you joined us and you took this time out to visit. Um, it's a great book. You should absolutely read it. I have it dog-eared all over the place. I can't wait for you to sign it next month when I see you at the sanctuary. Um, uh, I'm so glad that there are so many things that are no longer relevant in the book, and I can't wait for the next chapter when all non-human primates are out of labs. Um, I hope I write that book. <laughs> I can't wait to read I hope it. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Erica. Thank you, Holly. And um, we don't have another book on the agenda for our next book club, but um, hopefully I'll think of something soon and we'll get something out there. Maybe you're our finale. Who knows? Oh, no, I can't be. Keep going. <laughs> And thank you for everybody that has tuned in today. Um, come back in, next week. We're going to have Go Ape Bingo with Jolene. So check that out. Find more details on our website. Very good. Thank Bye you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>